This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. You may be seated. He's such an awesome God. We love him and bless him and honor him just for who he is. Wonderful Savior. Gracious Redeemer. Well, our text today comes from the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel, the Old Testament, verse 31 and 32. You never throw away the Old Testament just because you have a New Testament. You have to understand the whole Bible is treasure. You wouldn't throw away old money just because you get new money because it has value. You never throw away the old. It is the Old Testament that gives context to the New Testament. So in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, notice the word of the Lord here. Armed forces of his, of his will arise in Jerusalem and defile and desecrate the sanctuary, the spiritual stronghold, and will do away with the regular sacrifice, that is the daily burnt offering. And they will set up a pagan altar in the sanctuary, which is the abomination of desolation. With smooth words of flattery and praise, he will turn to godlessness those who are willing to disregard the Mosaic Covenant. But the people who are spiritually mature and know their God will display strength and take action to resist. I'm speaking today from the subject the people who know, the people who know. This is an excerpt from a message that an angel of the Lord delivered to Daniel the prophet. Daniel is from the tribe of Judah, the same tribe that uh, Jesus is from. The name Daniel means God is judge. And uh, he was judging the abomination, the sin of the nation, because these were God's people who somehow had drifted from their foundations in God. And an enemy sneaked in and began to create counterfeit worship, setting up things in the temple, in the house of God. It came to a familiar place and began to pull away their devotion from the true and the living God and this is a prophetic message to what the devil is doing in our world today. Uh, this is talking about in the times of Daniel but you know this is a living book. This book is alive and well and he began to attack the altars, the place of worship and gave them false altars so that they began to worship idols which was an abomination to God and they created the abomination of desolation. We are in those days today. We are in those days today. And this is why God is saying, you know, the people that know their God, who are spiritually mature and who know, the people who are spiritually mature and know, but this is a picture of spiritual warfare. So that when you are thriving in God, that when you are making advances in establishing the kingdom of God on the earth as it is in heaven, you come under satanic and demonic attack. There are some things that are happening to you right now, not because you're doing the wrong things, but because you're doing the right thing. When you're out doing the devil's bidding, the devil doesn't bother you. He just lets you think that you, it's, it's going to be happy and it's going to last forever. But the moment that you make up your mind that I'm going to serve God, and my family is going to serve God. The moment that you try to do right, here comes the devil. He's getting ready to unleash uh, an attack against you. And particularly if you bring light to areas of darkness, the moment that you start piercing the darkness, the moment that you begin to start praying and interceding over people's lives that are bound and who need to be delivered, the devil is coming after you. 
He's going to begin to attack your physical body with maladies. He's going to attack your mind, your emotions. He's getting ready. If he can't get you, he'll get somebody close to you. Somebody that you love. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How he starts messing with your relationship, with your son, with your daughter, with your spouse, with your mama, with your brother, with your sister. This, an enemy hath done this. And he's coming in in the midst of that because God is trying to use your life to pierce the darkness. And you might think that, God, I'm trying to serve you. God, I'm on fire for you. And all hell is breaking loose coming in your finances and now stuff is happening to you and where you used to be able to wheel and deal now there seems to be a blockage an enemy has done this but i'm telling you that when the enemy comes in like a flood my god he begins yes he's in the process of lifting up a standard against them i'm just here to tell you today that i sit by the spirit of the living god i've been hearing in the spirit in these last days here that these are the days of Elijah these are the days of Elijah Elijah is a sign of a prophetic voice this is not the teacher this is not the evangelist this is the prophet that is declaring something in the heavenlies that begins to say here is what God is doing Amos chapter 3 says that God will do nothing in the earth unless he reveals his secret to his servants the prophet this is the time for the prophetic voice of the Lord to go forth in the earth. This is a time for the prophetic voice of the Lord to go forth in the earth. And he began to declare in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 and 6 that except Jesus comes, he said before that great and notable day of the Lord shall come, he would send the spirit of Elijah. It is a picture of the prophetic. And when he comes, here's what he's going to do. He's going to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the heart of children back to daddy. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yeah, mama is sweet. Mama is nice. We need good mothers. But daddy, 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 arise and get in your place. Father, get your heart right. Turn it toward your son and your daughter. They need you. My God, there is a turning, there's a turning, there's a turning before that great and notable day comes. It's not that the children wake up, it's that daddy wakes up and says, my son needs me, my daughter needs me, the house needs me. There is value for you. I celebrate women, I celebrate your accomplishment, but listen, you gotta get back to the foundation. You gotta get the foundation. The woman came out of the man. If your foundation is eroded, you can put beautiful furniture on it, but baby, you're going through the floor in a minute. You're gonna go to sit down and you're going through the floor. It's time to reinforce. It's time to reinforce your foundations. Psalms 11:3. if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? He's saying, I'm going to set things right when Jesus comes. I'm telling you, we are a preparer for the anointing of the kingdom of God to come back into the earth. That's why he said, Spirit of Elijah, come on back here. And this is where we are in a day of darkness and idols have filled the land. And God is saying, it's time now. These are prophetic times. I am in my element now. I hear his voice. I am not convoluted and twisted. I understand what time it is. I know these are the days of Elijah. And he's going to awaken something in the foundations. Foundation is going to attack business. It's coming to government, arts and entertainment. God is going to restore. He's in the process of restoring and recovering that that is out of place twisted emotions apathy the holy ghost is moving he's getting ready i'm just telling you when daddy gets on fire for jesus the whole house i'm here to tell you god's gonna do something he been letting mama go to church with the children but now god god god's gonna deal with daddy's heart this time yeah there's a call coming out of zion i'm telling you i hear his voice god is up to something and may i tell you that what god is doing you won't be able to stop it you'll see it but you can't stop it you'll see it but no devil in hell no weapon that is formed i'm here to tell you god is establishing something by his spirit 
Take your seat. Let's go a little deeper. But he wanted to mess up the sanctuary. He takes the men out of their place. Men are the protectors. They're the warriors. It's wonderful to have praying women, but when men pray, my seagulls, something shifts in the atmosphere. The devil understands the recognition of authority. He has to recognize authority. He can't just come in and do what he wants to do. He has to recognize authority. He had to ask God for permission to mess with Job. He has to recognize authority. And there is a remnant of people in the earth that know. They know what time it is. And the people that know, the people that know, the people that know, we don't realize that he, when, he, when you can't stop something, you try to derail it by getting it off track. If you want to stop people from serving the true and the living God, making the daily sacrifice, bring a false idol. And America is full of idolatry. I've seen into the realm of the spirit, this is a land full of idolatry. We thought that India was a land of 10 million gods, all of these millions of gods, but America is loaded with idols. Idols are all over America. They are intertwined in our culture now. We have become desensitized to the idols that have grabbed our hearts and our affection. And I love something that Wendy Speaks said. She said that the quickest way to recognize an idol in your life is to notice your response when it is taken away. You got any idols in your life? What happens when a parent has to threaten their child and take the idol of their phone away? Watch their reaction. Watch them when you take their video game controller away. Watch. Just, just check it out. Watch, watch what happened. Watch what happens. You'd be surprised. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not just, it's not that's always lustful thing. Sometimes it's, it's, it's the food on the plate. You, you, you play with somebody's food, sometimes they're liable to stab you. <laughs> just, 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 uh, just watch how you react when certain things are taken away. And I'm just telling you, we're in those days now when everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken will be that which remains. And God's, he's, he's, he's going to shake some things up. We're in warfare now. And let me just tell you, whenever you're in warfare, you have to stand at heightened attention. It is not the time to get drunk. It's time to be sober and to be aware, to be totally alert and to be intentional. This is a time of intentionality because we've got to be incredibly sober because we are in a war. There's a war going on. He's warring for your mind. He's warring for your time. He's warring for your attention. He's warring for your devotion. There's a war going on. He's coming trying to separate uh, houses. He's trying to separate. There is a war going on. But I'm so glad that we've got a Savior. I'm not upset. I have a blessed hope. I have a blessed hope. I have a blessed hope. And I decree to you, but the people who know their God, the people who know their God, the people who know their God, the word know in scripture is used two and a half times more than the word love. Because we have a tendency in our culture now to fall in love with people that we don't know. To know God is to love him. The more you know him, the more you love him. But we fall in love with people that end up breaking our heart because we didn't know them. We didn't know them. We didn't know them. The word know comes from a Hebrew word, yada, Y-A-D-A. And it means to perceive or to understand. When you, when you know you, you perceive this, you, you are able to perceive it. To perceive it is based on your outlook, your understanding, your perception. Your perspective is what you see. Your perception is how you interpret what you see. When you know, you perceive certain things. A man knows when he's able to perceive that she likes him. 
A woman can tell when a man likes her. She perceives it. She perceives it. If you're walking down the street and you, and you see somebody and you, you glance at them and then turn back, but the second look, <laughs> oh, you know, that, you know what's up then. It's not the first look, it's the, it's the second look when you look back. You perceive something. When you know a knowing is a perceiving, it is an understanding. The Apostle Paul went into Mars Hill and he said he saw a sign there saying to the unknown God because there in their culture they were worshiping the God that they didn't know. Paul comes in. You're talking about relevancy in ministry. Paul says, you see this monument that you guys have built to the unknown God? He says, I know that God. Let me tell you about him. I know about I know him. And let me tell you about the very one to whom you have built a monument and you don't know him. You build something in his honor and yet you don't know him. You carry his Bible and yet you don't. You don't even perceive him. You don't understand him. But to know him, not only in the glory of the resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his sufferings. To know him that I might know you that I might apprehend that by which I am, have been apprehended. Let me grasp the very thing, Lord, I want to lay hold of you because you've laid hold of me. Who is this? What is this that has snatched me up and caught me? What is this that has apprehended my heart and my affection? What is this that has arrested me with a call? What is this I want to catch hold and understand and perceive what has taken hold of me? It's like something's got a hold of me. I want to know who you are. I want to know who you are. I want to know who you are. And he's, he's just saying, know me. To know is like, it's a deeper word than just head knowledge. And the Bible often says in the King James Version, Adam knew Eve and she conceived. It is an intimate knowing. It's not, this is not a casual knowing from a distance. This is not just reading about him in a Sunday school class, in a little weekly devotional. This, this is an intimate knowing of him. It's an intimate knowing of him. You know, like when you find couples that have been together a long time, that woman, she knows that man. She, know, she knows his tendencies. She knows his weaknesses. She knows what makes him happy. She knows when to shut her mouth. Well, sometimes, but... <laughs> but she knows it. She knows how to push his buttons. She knows where every button of his is located. And she knows how to push him to get a reaction when he's ignoring her or when he's getting on her nerves. She knows how to work him because she knows him. You don't get that on the first date. You don't get that on the first date. She knows, and when you know somebody, you know how to hang. The people would say this, that the fool you know is better than the fool you don't. Because they would know, I know what his weaknesses are. I know what her weaknesses are. I know what their strengths are. I know what their bad points are. I know what their good points are. I know what their vulnerabilities are, their temptations are. And yet I know what their virtues are. I know them. It's when you're able to take both the positive and the negative, the good and the bad, the bitter and the sweet, and add water to it, the water of the Spirit, and enjoy the lemonade. When you know, when you know, when you when you know there's something that you just have to know. Some women have men who, who are just natural flirts. But they know he's not going anywhere. He's coming home to me, he's bringing his check home to me. <laughs> and they know that. It's like, I'm not even worried about that, I know. He's been doing that all his life, he's probably still going to be doing it when Jesus comes. But <laughs> I know him. I know him. 
See, the people that know, when you know, you know. You don't have to explain things to people when you've got a common experience. When you know, you, you know. I mean, if you live in the South, anybody, anybody born and raised in the South, wave your hand, wave. Ooh, you know. You know how we like our sweet tea. You know, you know how we like the fried chicken. You know how we like the pound cake. If you know, you know. You, you just, you, you know. There's certain things that you just, you know. And the people that know their God, who are intimately acquainted with him, who know how he moves and to say that just because God delays and takes his time does not mean that he's not coming through right on time. When you know God, Lazarus may be dead, but you know that he is the resurrection and the... When you know you, you just know. When you know you, you know. You don't have to explain it to anybody. You just, you rest in knowing God. I know God's going to take care of me. You, you, you find some old people, they have, such a, they, have, they have such a confidence. I'm telling you, whenever you get flustered, call somebody who's old, who has been through some storms and survived. They know him. And they say, all right, baby, don't pay that no attention. You just stay right there. Everything going to be all right. It's not deep. That, that theology is not deep. But I tell you, they know God. They know God. That through many dangers, toils, and snares, Lord, I have already come. Yeah, Lord. <laughs> they know something about the good old days and the God that brought them through difficult times, storms, tests, trials, tribulation, pain, sickness, running out of food, bills are due. They know, they know, not knowing where your next meal is coming from, but somehow God makes a way for you to not only get some education, but to be able to educate your children when you got to do it all by yourself and you didn't know how you were able to do it. When you look back at what God graced you to be able to do and you look at your pay stub and what your net that you brought home and you say, how on earth was I able to do this and raise three children? How can I do this and raise a son and a daughter? How, Lord, I, Jesus, 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 I know you. You can't talk people out of that when they know God. When he delivered you, when he healed you, when he set you free, when he brought balance to your mind, when he quelled your anxiety, you know, you know, you know, you know. The people that know, they know, you know. It's amazing. You can't ever take for granted that there are people that have a confidence in them because they know. Here's a principle I want to give you. Knowledge breeds confidence. Knowledge breeds confidence. You can tell confident people. They don't sweat it. They don't care how good the competition that has gone before them because they know their God. They know something you don't know. There are people that you can challenge them and they sort of just smile. And you'll be like wondering, what in the world are they going to do now? Sometimes you may not know at the moment, but you know God. Like, Lord, you know what? I don't know how you're going to bring me out of this. But Jesus, my eyes on you. Lord, you, you, I'm looking at you, Lord, because everybody's looking at me. Jesus. They called me and told me how much it was, was, was due, how much I owed. Jesus. And I don't need them looking at me. But my eyes are on you, Lord. It's amazing that when you do that, when you, when you know something and other people around you, they don't know what you know. They just see you, but they don't know what you know. You know, when you help people, you can give people a hand. You can share your knowledge. Isn't it amazing? Even when you share your knowledge, it doesn't decrease your knowledge. It reinforces it. 
And I'm so glad. That's why, that's why I love young people. They, they are not my enemy. They are my reinforcement. They're the thing that will continue something. But there's something that I know that they need to know. I carry something that they need to know. I'm not guessing about it. There are certain things that I, I know. Don't just ask me what I think. Ask me what I know. See, and we know that all things, Romans 8, 28, not, not think, not guess, not hope so. And we know that all things will work together for the good of them. We don't have to know how, and we know that. If you'll just know that, just know that, just know that, just know that. I don't know how, I don't know when, and we know that all things shall work together for the good of them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. So when people are asking you about the particulars, about the when and the where and the how, I can't help you right there, but I know that. I don't guess, it's not hope, wishful thinking. I know that all things, all th I know all things are working together for my good because I love God. You got a dangerous man or woman when they know God. Dangerous. Take a look at this little video clip of a dangerous mama. If you get this car into this cup, I'll give you $100, okay? It's easy. $100, there's one catch. This cup has to be upside down. Get this ball into that cup, you get $100. It has to be upside down. It has to be upside down. You're just like, oh, no, 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 no. What? There's a catch, you went too fast. Let me do the thing first, and then we can go, okay? okay. Got to take your time here. You didn't say that the first time. Oh, this ball into that cup, upside down. You can't touch that cup, though. But I can move this cup. Yes, you can move that cup, whatever you want to do. Leave it right there, yeah. Can't move it now. Oh, okay. What the son didn't know is that his mama was a physics teacher and that physics had taught her something that trumped his ability to block her, so he lost his $100 because she was in the in the know and when you know you know the people that know when you know you know here's what I want you to see in Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17 no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue every tongue every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn Notice every tongue that rises in judgment against you, somebody that's judging you unfairly, somebody who doesn't know you, who's putting their mouth on you. He says, no, no, notice, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. This is a part of your divine inheritance. If you are a servant of God, you have uh, an inheritance that comes from God. Your inheritance as a servant of the Lord is the authority to condemn voices of darkness that accuse you and confuse you. It's a, it's a godly inheritance that belongs to the servants of the Lord. You have the authority to condemn those voices of darkness that accuse you and confuse you. I don't care if it's the devil, what the devil says against you. I don't care if it's what others say against you. I don't care if it's what the past says against you. I don't care if it's even what you and your own mind and negative thinking and pessimism will say against you. It's what God says about you that matters. And that's why those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. But you have an authority to be able to say, you know, no, 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 devil, no, that's not me. That thought didn't come from, from God. You have to recognize the source and you have to know. You have to be in the know, be in the know, be in the know. I love Daniel eleven thirty two 32 in the New American uh, Revised Edition. It says, by his deceit, 
He shall make some who were disloyal forsake the covenant. Disloyal forsake the covenant. You can't make loyal people forsake covenant. You cannot make loyal people forsake covenant. But those who remain loyal to their God shall take strong action. The devil can only appeal to disloyal people. He, his tricks don't work with loyal people. His tricks don't work with loyal people. His tricks don't work with loyal people. You got a loyal person that's in your corner? Flaws and all. They say, you know, he may be flawed, but he's mine. Get your hands off of him. Back up. Flaws and all. But I want you to understand loyalty is not just about, uh, you know, some feeling. Loyalty is a depth of love that does not come with short-term or casual encounters, but with maturity, understanding, and empathetic sacrifice. When you have loyalty in a person. And there's a, there's a world of difference between being loyal and being faithful. A person can show up every day at 8 o'clock on time and unlock a building to let everybody in the building. Faithfully does that. But he can come in and unlock that building and then go in somebody's office and steal something off their desk. He's faithful, but he's not loyal. Now, faithful just sort of means that they are con they're consistent in doing that, and you can set your clock by them. They'll faithfully be there. But a loyal person will never steal from you. A loyal person will never break covenant. Listen, a loyal person is a person that remains faithful to you in your absence. It is a loyal person who will not try to lower the esteem of who you are in the eyes of another person behind your back. That's how you know that you have somebody who's really for you. There are people that will grin in your face and tell you positive things in your face and act like they're your friend and then get behind your back and start diminishing the honor and the character of who you are in the eyes of somebody else. That's disloyalty. Loyalty will keep the honor there even when you're not around to hear it personally. It's honoring a person even in their absence. That's loyalty. That's why uh, Gideon was loyal to God. David was loyal to God. You hear him sort of cursing God? David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who, who are you that you would defy the living God? How dare you? I don't care how big you are. See, loyalty to somebody is not threatened by their size because you really realize when you know God, you realize God's bigger than this. God is bigger than this. God is bigger than this. Faith is having more faith in God than in the circumstance that looks like is going to take advantage of you. It's, it's esteeming God to be bigger than your trouble, bigger than your money problem, bigger than your health issue. It says God is greater. God is bigger. I exalt him. My faith is in the one who is greater. I know him. I know him. I know him. I know him. Knowing God makes a difference. Knowing God makes a difference. I mean, Goliath was nine feet tall. David was a regular sized man. Goliath didn't know God. He was a Philistine. He, was a, he worshiped pagan gods. He didn't know God. David knew God. And the one who knew God was able to kill the one who didn't know him. It's interesting that the Midianites, they were, they were an army of 135,000. They were a pagan nation. They didn't know God. Gideon knew God. And Gideon took 300 men and defeated an army of 135,000 because he knew God. The 135,000 didn't know God. And when you know God, you can take hold of stuff that's bigger than what it looks like you can handle. When you know God, God will give you a vision bigger than what you can do. And let me just tell you this. One way that you know that you got a vision from God is because you say, Lord, there's no way in the world that I can do that. Because if God gives you a vision and tells you to do it and then you say, yeah, okay, God, yeah, I can handle that. I can do that. I got you. I got you. Dude, I got you then that means that dream didn't come from God because God would never give you a dream that you can do without his help. Why would he write himself out of the script in your life? So you're going to need him to get you over a hurdle, over a Red Sea, uh, beyond an army, against demonic forces that are going to come against you. I'm telling you, the moment that you start piercing the darkness, all hell is going to break loose, but the Lord is with you. 
the one that is with you is greater than the enemy army that's coming against you the stuff that's being unleashed against you God is greater God is greater just touch, touch, touch somebody next to you say God is greater God is greater God is greater and there's such a vast difference between knowing God and knowing about God you got to really know God and when you don't you get twisted in your behavior and you'll see it coming out in the outward manifestation because your inner loyalties will always produce a fruit notice what happens in Romans chapter 1 in verse 22 through 25 claiming to be wise they instead became utter fools and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired and as a result they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies and they traded the truth about God for a lie so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise amen you know why we've got to know God have any idea why we've got to know God is because you cannot trust somebody you don't know you cannot trust somebody that you don't know I would love to see how you would react if some stranger walks up to you or knocks on your door and says excuse me ma'am may you give me please the pin number to your debit account <laughs> and you don't know them and they're asking you for something and you don't know them you cannot trust people that you do not know it is not wise you cannot trust people that you do not know but the knowledge of God comes from connecting with God communicating with God or communing with God and then communicating with God connecting with God we connect with God through his word we connect with God through fellow believers with the Saints with the church we commune with God uh, in nature we commune with God in spirit we commune with God in worship you can go out fishing and commune with God you can walk among the trees go out on a trail go to the mountains go to the oceans and the heavens declare the glory of God uh, you can commune with them and communicating with God we communicate with God in prayer we communicate with God in a in a dialogue prayer is a dialogue it is not a monologue it's not a prayer request line to heaven and we think that if you get on your knees and call God and pray and say dear Lord Jesus sweet baby Jesus I come to you asking you oh God that you will just begin to move in my life and your sons and, and Lord yes you know the so-and-so that's what's working out with Johnny oh God I just pray <laughs> and Lord Jesus may you please help my car not to break down on me Lord while I'm driving on 285 oh God please thank you Lord in Jesus name bye bye <laughs> no 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 prayer prayer is a conversation communication is never one way it's a dialogue you speak and you listen and the real art of communication is not in our ability to speak it is in our ability to listen and hear it's in our willingness to be still and hear the voice of God when I pray I listen for God's voice don't get up too quickly you can't be in a hurry when you're communicating with God just pray until God begins to speak and God will put an impulse in your spirit God will plug a thought in your mind God will bring a spirit of peace sometimes God answers by his presence God's presence communicates sometimes you can be stressed out and all of a sudden you just feel God coming in on you and his presence is saying child I'm with you and everything is gonna be all right and nobody opened their mouth but yet communication happened because God's presence speaks don't pray and leave before God has had his say learn to wait in his presence prayer is a dialogue it is an exchange between two hearts of people that know each other and love each other care for each other you express your heart but now listen for the response of God listen for the impulse of God coming back into your heart you can you can give God your stress and God answers with his peace 
Sometimes you don't even know what happened, but all of a sudden the peace of God just fills your heart and all that you know, you know that you know that it's going to be all right. And one of the great times to pray is just right before you go to sleep at night. Because sometimes God will speak to you over the course of the night and when you wake up the next morning, you'll know what you need to do. Anybody ever gone through that? You prayed at night and when you wake up in the morning, it's like, uh uh-uh. I can't enter into this deal. I got to tear that contract up. No, nope, I'm not getting into that partnership. I, uh-uh, the wedding is off. You, you, you go to bed. <laughs> and somehow when you wake up in the morning, you have a clarity of what you need to do because the Holy Spirit has communicated to you in the night. So pray at night and just, just listen. Sometimes the only time that we can quiet ourselves is when we're asleep. The Bible says that while, in the book of Job, that while men's uh, hearts slumber on their beds, he opens their spirit and begins to speak and gives them visions of the night. And sometimes you can wake up with an awareness of what you need to do just because God has been there. So take it to him. Take it to him. Give it to him and just watch what God will do. Watch what God will do. He's an awesome God. If you need to really know God, Jesus gave us a simple formula. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Now let me tell, explain to you that in this agriculture culture of Jesus at that time, a yoke was this wooden apparatus that you put on oxen. And uh, Jesus, you would never yoke just uh, a big ox with, you know, just a, a, a tiny ox. They were oftentimes equally yoked. But when you were trying to train a young ox, you yoked them with a big ox. Jesus says, take my yoke. Get into the yoke with me. It's, it was a burden. So God has to bring a problem into your life. You want to get to know me? He says, come on, step into this Get into this yoke with me. Get into this problem with me, something that you can't handle on your own. And the big ox, every time the big ox stooped down to feed, the young ox had to feed or or else he was in the yoke with him. He's going to break his neck. He says, just get in the yoke with me and learn. He says, watch what I do. What I do, you do. When I come up, you come up. When I walk, you walk. Because if you don't, I'm going to drag you. He just says, take my yoke. It's easy. Yield your will to me. Yield your will to me, and then we'll be all right. You'll you'll learn of me. You're coming into this wooden yoke with me. The big ox is now yoked with the inexperienced ox, and he said, you'll learn my ways. You'll learn when it's time to feed. You'll learn when it's time to stop and drink. You'll learn when it's time to lay down, when it's time to rest. You'll learn when it's time to go to move at a more deliberate pace. Get in the yoke with me because you don't even know when to keep your mouth shut. Just get in the yoke and what I do, you do. He's saying, yield to me, yield to me, yield to me. See, the yoke of Jesus is to humbly do his will and allow him to guide and to direct our lives. You come in the yoke with him. Allow him to guide and to direct your life so that when he says, all right, that's enough of that, get up out of the bed. That's the big ox yanking you up when you wake up at 3.38 3.38 in the morning and you can't get back to sleep. The big ox is a hat. It's time to feed. I know you don't want to get up right now, but get your behind up. You're not going back to sleep now. Bam. Get in the yoke and learn of me. I'm just trying to give you a picture of the yoke. You got into it with the big experienced animal and they trained the younger animal by yoking them with experience. That's how you learn. That's how you learn. It was an apprenticeship. So you want to learn something? I need to put some responsibility on your shoulders to keep your feet on the ground. I don't know that my dad would have done well with some young folks today whose whole adventure is to play video games. Or he was going to dump some responsibility on your shoulders to keep your feet on the ground. See, I got in the yoke with him. And I learned of him 
You get in the yoke with Jesus, you'll learn his ways. And I'm telling you, it's a matter of surrendering to his lead, letting him lead, letting him guide. Because he's giving you gentle nudges the whole time saying, come on, be still. Come on, rise up. It's work time now. It's time to get up and feed. See, remember in Daniel 11, they started attacking their daily devotion. It's your daily devotion that actually feeds you and strengthens you on a daily basis. If he can interrupt and say, hey, it's not necessary for you to read the Bible every day. Because see, if you miss one day, it's easy to miss two. And then three. And before you know it, you'll miss seven. And seven days without this Bible makes one W-E-A-K week. And, it'll be, and then weeks will turn into months. And before you know it, you would not have been in the book in a long time. And it all starts with just letting one slip. If you let one day slip, don't let two. And certainly don't let three. Because you'll get weaker by the day and he'll wait until you have gone without the daily feeding. Give us this day, Jesus taught us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. There's certain things that if you're going to have the strength of the Lord to be strong in the Lord, you're going to have to eat it daily, daily. You're going to have to drink of the word daily. You're going to have to pray daily. I know you're not going to just literally backslide if you miss one day. I understand that. But he's trying to disrupt your habit pattern. He's trying to, to do that to disrupt the thing that, gives, that keeps your body strong, your mind uh, keen, and your spirit alert. He's trying to disrupt your process of the good habits that you have because the secret to success is always found in the daily routine. He's trying to strip devotion out of your daily routine. He's trying to take out of your life a daily time that is devoted to God. To say, God, speak to me. Start your day with prayer. Start your day with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. If you know, you know. And if you know, you show. You do exploit. There's something that you do. When you know God, you find the fruit of it in the life of a person. You shall know them by the fruit that they bear. I'm not a judge, but I'm a fruit inspector. You shall know them by the fruit that they bear. You shall know them by the fruit that they bear. And also you shall know because you feel, you, because you remember. You'll know because you remember. You have to remember what God did for you in yesteryears. Nobody did. Notice Psalm 106 in verse 9 through 15. It's talking about that journey of what God did for the children of Israel. He rebuked the Red Sea also and dried it up. And so he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And, and notice he saved them from the hand of him who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Then notice the waters covered their enemies and there was not one of them left. And then they believed his words. They sang his praise. And then they soon forgot his works. And they did not wait for his counsel but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Ever tried to wear God out about what you wanted and once you got him or her, it sent leanness into your soul? You thought as soon as you got the job, as soon as you got the position, as soon as you got the money, as soon as you got the house, you got what you wanted, but he sent leanness into your soul. Well, I want you to hear verse 13 through 15 in the message version of the Bible. Notice, but it wasn't long before they forgot the whole thing. They wouldn't wait to be told what to do. They only cared about pleasing themselves in that desert, provoked God with their insistent demands, and he gave them exactly what they asked for, but along with it, they got an empty heart. It is the same thing that has happened to us in America. That we wanted God to prosper us in this land, and we became a land of prosperity and ingenuity and creativity and now we are suffering like we have not suffered in many years with racial tension, 
physical violence and mass shootings, political division, sexual confusion and dysphoria, selfish ambition, anxiety disorders, depression disorder, bipolar disorder, all kinds of addictions to drugs, alcohol, gambling, porn, the internet, suicide ideation, spiritual disorientation where people fall away from God. They are agnostics. They are atheists. They are involved in witchcraft and voodoo. And these are pagan substitutes that he set up a false altar to get them taken off their course. But they that know their God. And I'm telling you, it's a, this is a picture of spiritual warfare. It is a picture of spiritual warfare. He said to us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 through 13 in the Phillips translation, it says, in conclusion, be strong. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Not in yourselves, but in the Lord, in the power of his boundless resource. And put on God's complete armor so that you can successfully resist all the deaf devil's methods of attack. For our fight is not against any physical enemy. It is against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are up against the unseen power that controls this dark world and the spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. Therefore, you must wear the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist evil in its day of power and that even when you have fought to a standstill that you may still stand your ground. This is the day in which we live today that you got to put on the whole armor of God and be able to stand and after you've done everything that you can do, stand anyhow. I'm just telling you that they that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. When God did things in the Old Testament, the Bible says that he made known his ways unto Moses, but his acts unto the children of Israel. Israel saw what God did. Moses understood why he did it. When you draw close to God and you really come into a knowledge of God, you'll have an understanding of knowing why God didn't give you what you asked for when you asked for it. And sometimes it takes a little living. It takes a heap of living in a house in order to make it a home. And then you'll look back and you'll understand, Lord, I understand now why you did this. You were preparing me. And when you walk with God, you will understand that everything that God put you through, everything that he allowed you to go through, you were gathering something from that. You are gathering a different knowledge of God. You have to know him as counselor. You have to know him as doctor. How would you know that he's a healer if you've never been sick? There are some things, I mean, a bread in a, in a, in a, in a, in a weary land, water, if you've never gone without. There's some things that you're going to have to be in some trouble that your mama can't get you out of. And daddy can't get you out of. Some people that you trusted in, they used to do that. We don't trust in horse and in chariot, man-made system, and the things that you have to be able to deal with. I want you to remember that it was in the year that King Uzziah died, that his relative, Isaiah, saw the Lord. He couldn't see him as long as his relatives were there providing everything. Because every time he had a need, his king, the king that was his relative, would provide it. But in the year that he died for the first time, all of his resources now were gone. Now who do I turn to? Mama them gone. Daddy gone. Brother gone. Sister gone. Who do I call now? He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw him. I saw him. I saw him. And I realized, God, you got me. Your hand is on me. You know me, God, and now you're letting me know you now in the midst of death, of losing the familiar and losing a resource that I could bank on. You took that out of the way so I could see you. What's been blocking you from being able to see God? What is it that God has been waiting to die in your life? So that you could see him. He wanted to be able to remove some stuff. Some stuff had to come so you didn't have another choice to go back and to depend on them. God said, I wanted you to depend on me. I wanted you to be able to see me. I began to remove them one by one until there was nothing left, until you came in brokenness. God says, I love brokenness. I love contrition of heart. I love it when you have given out of yourself. Whenever you've given out and you're hungry, God says, oh, goody, I love that because hunger draws me. Thirst draws me. Blessed, 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 Makarios. 
makarios, happy, blessed are those that hunger. Wonder why? Why would God call an empty person blessed? When you know God, he's the bread of life. He is the living water. He said, blessed, blessed, blessed are you. He didn't say you are poor and in pitiful shape. When you have a need, he says, blessed are you because now you're going to look to me. Your eyes are going to be on me. This is not by might nor by power, but God says this time, this is by my spirit. I'm going to break something that you couldn't break on your own. I'm going to deliver you out of a lust, out of an addiction, out of a habit that you don't even have the power within yourself to do. But he says, I want you to be able to see me. I want you to see me. I want you to look toward me. And I'm here to tell you today in the name of Jesus that God is going to deliver, that God's going to deliver men now in this hour, in this season. You're getting ready to see a revival happen with men. God is getting ready to restore the spirit of Elijah has been loosed in the earth. It is a prophetic spirit that will quicken their spirits of those men that have been in a deep sleep and a slumber. And God is calling men, men, men. He's calling them this time. He's calling them that you'll be restored, that your dignity will be restored, that your honor will be restored, that your respect will be restored. God is going to put you back into your position and into your place. He's going to raise you up as a man of honor, a man of integrity, a man of strength, a man of power, a man of glory, a man of reverence. In the name of Jesus, this is a new day. Much of this is in response to the prayers that women have prayed. And God said, I heard you crying out. Rachel weeping for her children. Weeping. You don't understand that when God is touching men, he's responding to the prayers of women. If you're a man in this place and you realize you've been out of the will of God, you've been, you don't know him like you need to know him. And you're in a struggle now and this is over your pay grade. And you say, God, I need you. One thing about men, men are bold. And if you're one of those men that says, God, I, I need to know you and I know I need to know you. It's time. Meet me here at this altar. Come on, come on, come on. Mothers that have been praying, sisters that have been praying. My, some of you are riding on a grandmother's prayer in the name of Jesus. My, you've been broken, busted, disgusted. You've been devalued. You've been falsely accused. You've not been appreciated. My God is up to something. God is up to something. Yes, he is. God is up to something. God is up to something. He's heard Rachel weeping for her children. Let me tell you this, man. There are tears in my eyes as you've come today. And as a prophet of the Lord, he instructed me, don't you wipe the tears away so that they don't see them. Because the Lord put our tear ducts in your eyes, not under my armpit. He could have put my tear ducts here so that nobody could see when I was weeping. He could have put them in my head, but he put them in my eyes so that every time that I was broken and hurting and afraid and angry and frustrated, how are you going to bear one another's burden and weep with them that weep if you can't see the tears in my eyes? Put them in a place of visibility, men, that we are not ashamed. This takes nothing away from my masculinity nor yours. This is cathartic.
and when our hearts weep because we are broken because of the condition of our families the condition of our finances the condition of the fitness of our physical bodies is weeping time men but if you'll let God break you I declare to you in the name of Jesus that he will build you there's some stuff that he must break down but he will build you up ladies stretch your hand toward these men I want to believe that the power of God and the spirit of Elijah will begin to turn 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 God God I pray in Jesus name move in the hearts move on them God you see them you see every man attached to every man of those that love them their families attached to these their loving relationships that are attached to these God some have been so devalued and accused and attacked and unappreciated God and I pray in the name of Jesus turn our hearts to you O Lord and we will be restored renew us as of the days of old Jesus do something in the, in the lives of your men in the land today this represents a remnant but father I pray in the name of Jesus that by the consummation of the power of the Holy Ghost that you will begin to turn our hearts toward the things that break your heart so we can hate what you hate and love what you love father give them a fresh revelation of you that they may know you not only in the glory of the resurrection but also God in the fellowship of the sufferings God, and help us to find brothers one with another. Strengthen so that we can be the men that you've called us to be. Men of strength and dignity. Men of honor. Men of character. Uncompromising men of loyalty. Father, we call this thing out that you placed in them. We are made in your image. And after your likeness. God, turn our hearts toward the children, the younger generation. Turn our hearts, God, so that the exchange can happen. May we have an empathetic love toward them. To allow them to be able to get in the yoke, and even as we learn, God, of your ways, that we will teach them. Turn our hearts, Lord. Let the fire of your Spirit mold in us what has been misshapen transform us by your power break every chain every fetter that binds today in the name of Jesus so that we become free not to do our own thing but free to worship you free to serve you free to pray free to honor you free to love you free to know you free to do what is right God set us free so we can serve you out of the willingness of our hearts break addictions tear down strongholds undo soul ties God we ask you wash us forgive us cleanse us God for worshiping the creation more than the creator forgive us wash us tear down every idol Lord in the groves, in every high place, God, of where we put something in a place where only you belong. God, unveil it to us so that we can reorder our priorities and put you back on the throne in our hearts. Lord, wash us, cleanse us, transform us today. Make us everything that we are called to be so that we can become a sweet-smelling savor, an aroma in your nostrils. God, have your way in our lives as we just wait in your presence for just a moment. Your Alpha and Omega, God. And Omega.
exploits. you do things that you could not do in your own strength. And what wouldn't work in the past, this is a new season now. This is a new season, says the Lord. It's a new season. I declare in the name of Jesus, fresh oil upon your lives. Fresh oil. Fresh oil. Fresh fire. He only sends oil when he intends to send fire. Fresh oil and fresh fire coming on your lives. Fresh oil. The anointing of God is a divine enabling ability of God to do what God has called you to do and to be what God has called you to be. It's a new day. The things that didn't work in the past, when you put your hand to it this time, God will give you fresh ideas that have been anointed this time. It'll have his eyes on it this time. As your heart is surrendered and the anointing of God is on you, the fire of God will fall where the sacrifice is placed. And as you place yourselves there, you will watch God, do something that will absolutely blow your mind. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, every household that is represented in this place today, may fresh oil and fresh fire fall. Fresh oil, fresh fire, fresh revelation. Bring a spirit of renewal, a spirit of mercy and forgiveness that will wash and cleanse and heal and restore oh God may may you let their families be recovered their dignity be recovered their honor be recovered their respect be recovered Lord in the name of Jesus their strength be recovered some have just gotten weary and they've just gotten tired and, and they've just said whatever but Lord may new strength come on them May they clothe themselves in the whole armor of God to be able to withstand all of the attack of the enemy, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, their loins girt about with truth, their feet shod with the preparation of gospel of peace, taking the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I pray in the name of Jesus that this equipped men in your whole armor will become a mighty army in the earth and God, that we will fight for our families, that we will fight for our wives, our sons, and our daughters, that we will do, Father, what you've called us to do, be what you've called us to be. And may it be, Father, for our good, but yet for your glory. May you do it today, Lord. Set a fire that cannot be extinguished. And we'll covenant in advance that we will give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.